You're listening to Spellbound. Welcome to episode 27 of Spellbound of Julian Smith. Spellbound is now a CastBox original. You can still listen to it anywhere else you typically listen to podcasts, but check out CastBox today and see what's making it the fastest growing and highest rated podcast app for both iOS and Android. All right, I'm joined today by Mark Bory, lawyer, award-winning journalist, historian, lecturer at Carleton University and the University of Ottawa in Canada. His most recent book is The Killing Game, about ISIS propaganda, but he's also written a book called Hemp, which is the one we're going to be focusing on more today. It's about the history of cannabis. We're going to be talking about the legalization of weed, especially in light of Canada recently becoming the second country in the world to legalize it for recreational use. Mark, thanks for being here with us today. Oh, no problem. Also joined by Andrew Rader. The fax machine is back once again. I'm back. Here he is in the flesh. <laughs> and uh, we call him the fax machine because he's full of facts, not faxes. <laughs> Hemp is one of my favorite plants. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't have any idea what your personal stance on the use of cannabis recreationally looks like. But I'm just really interested to hear about your perspective on the history of this plant because it has been used for you know thousands and thousands of years. And uh, it's, it's kind of funny that it's just now kind of coming into the public conversation. Yeah, it, it is. It's been legal to grow it in Canada for about oh, 15 years, maybe almost 20 years. Um, but you would think they were that people who grow it were growing, I don't know, like opium poppies by the side of the road with the amount of restrictions and fencing and uh, permits and everything for this stuff. Really, anybody who raids a hemp field to smoke can believe is pretty desperate for us to get high, and we'll probably only hyperventilate anyway. As for marijuana, Canada was the first country to ban it after France banned and unbanned it, uh, we banned it about uh, 18 years before the United States. Oh, that's interesting. Um, hmm. Yeah, we banned it, and then the government of Canada forgot they banned it. And then when the Americans banned it, they turned around <laughs> and they banned it again. <laughs> nice. Because it was that much of a non-problem that they'd actually forgot that they banned it. Well, it was a taxation issue for most countries, right? Well, your government used an illegal sleight of hand to ban it. Um, your federal government doesn't have power over criminal law normally. So they used a tax trick to say that uh, you had to buy a marijuana tax stamp under the Marijuana Tax Stamp Act. And uh, it was a dollar for the stamp, but they wouldn't sell you the stamp. So instead of being prosecuted for having marijuana, you were prosecuted for not buying the stamp. Wow. Hmm. In Canada, they put it under the Opium Act, which was basically the drug law. The federal government in Canada has is in charge of drug laws. Uh, and criminal law. So they just stuck it on the list of drugs in uh, 1920, and then they they forgot. But they also, nobody knows why they put it on the list in 1920. Um, there's a, there was a book that came out written by a woman who became a feminist icon, trashing marijuana um, in one chapter. So that's probably what did it. Anyway, they, they banned it in Canada, and it, it was a gone problem here. There, there were... People who smoked it, my fa- my grandfather worked on the Great Lakes ships, and he said that some of the, the, the black dudes in the holds that were, you know, that had the crappiest jobs shoveling coal, that they would smoke weed as a way of sort of taking the edge off. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah, so when I smoked them up in 1974, it brought back these memories of the 30s with him on, you know, Lake Michigan, you know, smoking reefer with these guys down the bottom of, of Great Lakes freighters. And he said it didn't really get him off then, and it didn't get him off in 1974 either, so it was a bit of a waste of pot. The banning of marijuana, at least in the United States, is connected to race. Is that also true in Canada then? Or how much is it true that it's connected to race, that, that that's why marijuana was singled out? Yeah, somewhat. Because uh, it, originally when it was put on the, the uh, Opium Act list in 19, the 1920s, um, it was put on there after articles that talked about uh, the problems of Mexicans having it in the states, and this idea that these Mexicans were not only a going to come to Canada, but they were b going to bring these drugs with them. And the woman uh, who wrote this book called The Black Candle, Emily Murphy, which talked about all these drug problems, claimed that the Mexicans, blacks in America and in Africa, and the Chinese were working together on a plot to basically hook white women on drugs so that they could be bred with people of color. There's a there's a statue to her on our Parliament Hill, by the way. Oh, yeah, I know this one. Yeah, yeah, the feminist statue, yeah. Yeah, she's quite a piece of work. 
I mean, you Google my name and you and Emily Murphy, you'll find a piece that I wrote in the National Post about about this. The National Post is a conservative paper in Canada, but they they've always been open to legalization of marijuana as sort of a libertarian issue, which is the way I've, I guess I've seen it too. I mean, I don't consider myself you know arch conservative, but I consider myself a libertarian when it comes to drug laws uh, because. Really, if you want to get high uh, in your house, it's not my business, really. If you want to like lose a few brain cells, as long as I don't have to pay to hospitalize you for the rest of your life, I'm cool with that, too. What about the impact of legalization? So Portugal decriminalized all drugs, including heroin, for example. And I, I want to talk about maybe the impacts we've seen in Canada so far. It may be a little bit early to tell from the complete legalization, but I guess it's been decriminalized for a long time. In Portugal, apparently, they've saved a ton of money. Uh, they've they've got rid of a ton of social problems. In Canada, unfortunately, being Canadians, we have gone sort of half-assed on this. And rather than to say legalize it, and I hear people say that, that Canada is legalizing marijuana. It is legalizing a very small corner of marijuana. So, in other words, it's not legal for me to sell you weed. It's not legal for you to take marijuana around um, and and like share it with your friends. That would still be considered trafficking. I'm not sure they're going to actually prosecute people for doing that. In Ontario, which is one of the provinces of Canada, all you'll be allowed to do is go to the government marijuana store, buy the government marijuana, and take it home and smoke it. If you do anything else with it, so if you say you, you take this marijuana home from the government store, which I'm sure it's going to be a cheery place, and uh, smoke half of pack or whatever in your home and then take the other half to your friend's house and smoke there, you'll be technically breaking the law. Wow. So it's going to open up a whole pile of new, I wouldn't say crimes because these are they're more misdemeanors or what we call provincial offenses. They're somewhere in the in the realm of a parking ticket. You get a ticket, you don't get a criminal record. Now the thing that worries me as a lawyer is this. If you have these records, these provincial records would be like a state charged there, I guess, in some ways. If you have these ticket-like things, the fines of maybe 100 bucks, will these show up when you go across the border? Because Americans made it clear that they're going to continue to ask Canadians to cross the border, some Canadians to cross the border. Do you smoke marijuana? Have you smoked marijuana? Most people just say no. The dumbasses are the ones who go, I went to college, and they get banned from the state. <laughs> so if, if if, if these things are barfed up in a computer check, that's a problem for a lot of people. So my big issue with them is they want to say, look, you shouldn't be smoking marijuana in your car. I say, okay, well, that's fine, but don't ruin somebody's life over it. I mean, that was always my big problem with marijuana laws was the hugely disproportionate punishment for a non-crime, right? So not only did you get convicted of something, which usually, unless it was a large amount of your dealing or importing or something with a fine or, or probation, but you got a record that completely screwed you for a whole pile of jobs and for border crossings and stuff. And that was the disproportionate part of it. Another thing that we lawyers, and I'm a fairly new lawyer, so it sounds weird for me to say it, but one of the things we want to do is we want to get all the people who have minor marijuana convictions pardoned and get those records out of the system so that people aren't being penalized in jobs, you know, hirings, in border crossings, whatever, because of something that really we've known in this country should have been legalized 60 years ago. Right. I mean, this stuff's way more mild than half of the pharmaceuticals people are taking without even thinking about it. Yeah. And Canada has basically been on the verge of legal, even though it's, it's 2018, we're finally legalizing it. It's been really since the 1960s that it was government policy to do something about it. And, you know, different governments have come and gone. But essentially over the years, you know, it was always one of these days we're going to fix this non-problem. We're going to make it so that at least it's not a criminal offense. So they talk about decriminalization of it so that people would only get a ticket if they were ever picked up with it anywhere. They've gone a little farther now because the Canadian marijuana growing industry has picked up. There's an awful lot of money being made in Canada setting up these large growing factories People are trading marijuana grow up stocks on the Toronto Stock Exchange. They've actually quite a few people paid quite a bit of money and very well connected people in this country. The former chief of the police force for Ontario, which is a, a province of 13 million 
million people. So if you were just to erase everything, we'd be one of the bigger states in the states, right? Our former police chief, who busted a lot of people for pot, is now one of the main executives of one of the biggest marijuana growing companies. Knows the business. And this is not abnormal. What do you think it's going to take for, uh, you know, this is still federally illegal in in the United States, even though you can get it fairly easily in California and Colorado and a few different states now. Um, but, I mean, what's it going to take, do you think, for the federal government to say, okay, this is okay, you can fly with it, you're not going to get, you know, punished if we catch it in your suitcase or something like that? It's such a huge backdown for the Americans because they've gone all in on this for so long. Right. One of the things they have to do is face down the very large police lobby that has made out like bandits on, on you know, marijuana law enforcement. Boy, in the current political climate, when everybody's so afraid of Trump and, and, and of looking like they're weak on anything, wow. I don't know. I, I think maybe it might just take a lot more states ratifying it. Almost sort of like a constitutional amendment where so many states would have decriminalized it or legalized it that the federal government looks ridiculous. But to think that something's going to happen on the national level in and of itself with uh, with the kind of leadership of the Democrats and, and the Trumpists, ooh, yeah, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. If you had if you had say forty states that legalized it um, or decriminalized it. Uh, then, then I think you'd see such a shift that, that the federal laws would become ridiculous. Well, the people want it. I mean, uh, there's no question about that. Yeah. Every state that's legalized it, and uh, every country for that matter, is uh, it's unanimously positive, right? Are there any downsides from these, these places that are legalizing it? The only downside that anybody's made in, in this country about legalizing it is the difficulty in determining if people are driving when they're so trash that they shouldn't be driving. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's no uh, breathalyzer, basically, equivalent oh, for yeah. marijuana, so it's hard to tell. All you have to do is stick your head in their car window, and you can smell it. Yeah, but what if they did it at a party and then got in their car? They could be totally high, and mm -hmm. you basically have no way of medically proving that. Even mm -hmm. if you can see symptoms of it, you can't really prove it if you're like a cop and you're trying to you know, look for people who are driving under the influence. It's mm -hmm. hard to show that people are actually driving under the influence. Well, it's different than alcohol, right? Because it stays in your system less. I mean, it actually, I think it stays in your system longer, but there's like, you're only actually high for like 15, 20, 30 minutes, absolute tops. So if you're getting in your car after a certain amount of time, you're probably going to be okay. It's probably, I, well, what you I'm do saying a lot of damage is, in that time. Yeah, well, what I'm saying is I'm not advocate. I'm, I want to be clear. I'm not advocating driving high. Uh, I'm saying that it should be easier than avoiding drunk driving because the high wears off so much quicker than like, like a beer does. A beer stays in your system for an hour. So it should be easier to avoid driving high than it is driving drunk, right? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I can only sort of speak from the experience with my own friends, right? Because nobody's done much surveying on this sort of thing. And a lot of my friends think that they can drive really well when they're high. I I've heard this argument. I've heard this. You, <laughs> yeah, you, you said maybe you, disagree? you think you can, but you actually I can't. Disagree. <laughs> I, I disagree basically because I know some people who are just messy when they're stoned. Yeah. I also know some people, I can't tell when they're stoned or not. Right. And this has got a big problem for the cops, right? Yeah. Like yeah. You, mm. with, with a breathalyzer, it's really simple. Right. You know, you blow over 0 0.08 or 0 0.1 or whatever the, you know, whatever the threshold is in your jurisdiction and you get charged. The cops could have pull people over and make them sort of touch their nose, walk straight line. Yeah, all you have to do is ask somebody who's really high to touch their nose and see if they laugh. And then they <laughs> yeah. fail the test. And, and, <laughs> and you hold a bag of Cheetos in front of them. <laughs> yeah. Do you want these? <laughs> you know, we're already yeah. getting um, new stores starting up. Like There are people who are selling pot, uh, hash, gummies, and stuff like that in stores in Ottawa, the nation's capital where I live. And then there are people who aren't quite as brave who sell pipes and bongs and, and munchy stuff like, like Cheetos and all kinds of stuff like that, but don't sell marijuana products. They've been doing that for decades, though. 20, 30 years ago, they were doing that in Ottawa with just the paraphernalia. Yeah. That's what San Francisco's had that for a long time. Right, because it could be like a tobacco pipe, yeah, technically, yeah, exactly, right? exactly, yeah. Like, who's going to smoke <laughs> tobacco in this bong? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And let me throw another one out for you. This, this is lots of fun, too, and I think a lot of Americans are going to think this is funny as hell. Our indigenous people, First Nations people, American Indians, whatever you want to call us, these folks, have done really well by selling untaxed cigarettes and uh, others and gasoline and stuff on their reserves. So say you're driving from, you know, one Canadian city to another, you're 
bound to go through an Indian reserve and people go in and they take up, we save like 25% of their gas and cigarettes are a lot cheaper at these places. They started about a year ago setting up pot shops. So there's a, there's a reserve between Ottawa and Toronto. So this would be busiest um, part of Canada. Not that far from the New York uh, border where there's 2,700 people on the reserve and almost 200 shops selling marijuana. Wow. Yeah. I want to go there. <laughs> yeah. And this is a Mohawk reserve, Mohawk Iroquois reserve. So they're, and they're basically saying to the government, we don't care what you say about licensing. We don't care what you say about inspections or records mm. or whatever. This is sovereign territory and we'll sell as much pot as we like and we'll get it from whoever we want. They have exemptions to do that with alcohol and tobacco and gasoline, as you said, and gambling and things like that. Um, is it covered by the same laws that allows them to do this, or are they breaking the law in some way? That's a really good question, and I'm glad you asked that question. I am, too. Thanks to the fax machine. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, because we have the faintest idea. And in the States, you know, casino gambling started on, on reserves, not because the government said, oh, yeah, that'd be a good idea. But because the American band started to do it, instead of the government come and get us. And after a while, the government just backed off. In Canada, we didn't quite have that with the casinos, but we certainly had it with the cigarettes. Uh, the government has tried everything to, to shut down these, these reserve stores, and then just started busting people, driving trucks full of cigarettes between these reserves. Hmm. But when you have 200 pot shops, a lot of this is geared for the American trade because this one reserve I'm thinking of, which is, let's see, I, I'll do the math here, about 70 miles from the Thousand Island Bridge crossing in upstate New York. So 200 pot shops, plus they have a great big store selling Cuban cigars. So we know who the market is here, right? That creates a really big problem for Americans who would buy it and then try to come back across the border. They definitely can't do that. It's going to be tricky. I, I, I mean, that would that, be pretty uh, dangerous, right? Oh, it's super dangerous. Yeah, you never want to cross a border with it. Right, yeah. And yeah, and, that, and that's going to be a problem, too. And I think people um, kind of get used to you know, carrying weed around their car. They uh, they grow some of their own, which is, which is legal. And they, say, keep a bag in their car or whatever. And they cross the border. If there's anything in the car, the American authorities will seize the car and keep it. I want to hear more about that story in a second. We're going to put a pin right there, though, to talk about the people who made today's episode possible. We're talking about Warby Parker. I'm so excited to be working with these guys. Give their free home try-on program a shot. Order five pairs of glasses and try them on for five days. There is no obligation to buy. Ships free and includes a prepaid return shipping label. Head to warbyparker.com slash spell to order your free home try-ons today. Glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. Lenses include anti-glare and anti-scratch coatings. And for every pair you buy, a pair is distributed to someone in need. They've got this crazy app you got to download on your phone. It's really awesome for trying on glasses, especially if you've got a weird-shaped face like me and glasses never look good on you. You can literally, if you've got an iPhone 10, take a picture of yourself, and it's got this technology, this depth technology, where using the iPhone's True Depth camera, it maps and measures key facial features, and using these measurements, Find Your Fit recommends approximately 12 Warby Parker frames that are most likely to look great on your face. This process is seamless. It only takes a few seconds, and it's great if you want to be sure you're going to get frames you like. I tried this myself. I ordered the Abbott, the Milton, the Watts, the Felix, and the Stockton. They arrived quickly. I was able to pick my favorites, and I shipped the others back. I didn't pay a thing, except for the glasses. I did I did pay for the glasses, because I had to. Otherwise, I'd, it would literally be stealing. But uh, I sent the others back, and the shipping was free. These glasses are super high quality. I can't believe how affordable they are. I think you're going to love them. If you're thinking about getting glasses, go to warbyparker.com slash spell and see what they have to offer. Okay, so Mark, before we left off, we were talking about getting caught with weed at the border. If you accidentally carry cannabis across a border, uh, are they actually going to, like, take you down? They're going to take your car? Can you, if you, can you, yeah. can, can, oh, yeah, can you, probably. can you be like, I didn't know it was in there. You can take it, throw it away, whatever. You're Ignorance right. is no excuse. Ignorance is no excuse. They don't care. They don't care. No excuse. Zero no tolerance. That's their, you might as well carve that right on the, wow. you know, on the sides of the American border. Uh, I heard of one case a few years back where a guy, went across in a rental car and he had a bit of marijuana, maybe a joint, maybe even less on him. They seized the car. Now they did give it back after about six months, 
Oh my gosh. But he's rented it for the weekend. <laughs> so he was liable uh, for th- six months of cost. <laughs> yeah. So he went back to the, he went to back to the car rental company. He said, can you give me a break and tr- change it from a, a daily rental to a monthly rental? They said, nope. So he ended up buying the car. Oh, oh you can do that from the rental? Oh, gosh. wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, you get stories like that all the time of, of seeds being found, roaches and ashtrays. Would you even face like jail time or something like that? What it, what would be the penalty in the United States for possession of like a joint or something like that? I don't even know at the federal level because basically the border is federal even if you're crossing to a state that allows it. Like if you're crossing into Washington, which I think allows marijuana recreationally now, you, at the federal checkpoint, you can't bring it. Right. It doesn't matter what the state law is. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I've heard quite a few cases of people being jailed for a week or two while their case is sorted out and then banned from the states. The first thing that's going to happen is a ban. And whether it's a lifetime ban or not would be uh, up to the border people. And they have a huge amount of power. Yeah. The constitutions of both countries are really suspended at the border. Yep. So a border officer can ask you anything. Yeah, they can search your phones now. They can search your phone. They can ask for your passwords for all of your social media. They can go through your car with a deal with a dog or whatever. There's no requirement to to have a sort of any kind of reasonable grounds to search your car or your belongings or whatever. Now you can say no and go back to where you come, where you've come from, but they'll then ban you from. Oh, you can, you States. can just you can just go back to Canada if you get caught with something. Well, illicit. if they catch you with anything, you're screwed. No, they've got you. Under what circumstance can you just turn around and, and go home? Well, if they say I want your Twitter login, oh, you can refuse access to your phone yeah. or social media accounts or something like that, and just go home. But but if you if you try to cross with yeah. marijuana, you're in deep trouble no matter what. You can't just pick up and say, "Oh, well, it's legal here. I'm going home." Yeah, when you think about it, no other place where an American or a Canadian can be stopped for no reason and have and the police... Demand. Yeah, no, they have huge authority to do almost anything at the border. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, if you're one of those people like me who just is freaked when they go to the border... Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty scary. Me. Yeah, they, have, they can do almost anything. Why are you freaked so at the border? Because there's marijuana in your car or just because you just don't like them? I, I just don't like the fact that I don't have any rights. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah. You don't know what they're going to search. You don't know what they're going to like. It's total invasion of privacy. I never had a problem at the border. I just have always been, when I was a kid, um, I was at the right age for it. Just was around draft age, but it was still around for a couple of years. And then when they got rid of it. So every time I crossed the border and, um, my mom's American. And my my mom's family's American. So I cross into Michigan all the time and stuff. And they would always want to know like my citizenship because they were checking to see if I dodged the draft, if I'd register. But I'm not an American citizen, so I had never registered for the draft. But that was always the thing they were looking for, and uh, so they were always going through my crap. Instead of solving a lot of legal problems, marijuana decriminalization or slash legalization in Canada is going to create a whole bunch of new, smaller problems. It's going to have to work out over over a period of years when we, you know, as we fight to get rid of the old criminal records, which is a big, big deal for me, and and work out really um, what the etiquette is of marijuana, right? Like, can you sit in a park and smoke a joint, you know? Because a lot of people think that's basically you know, a right. If you have the right to smoke pot, you should be able to smoke in the park. Well, some people don't like the smell. The smell is actually the one thing I'd say that is probably one of the biggest factors. Yeah. But like you said, most people who are using this, you can't tell when they're using it or when they're not because it's that mild of a substance. I think a lot of people can easily overdo it. I mean, if you don't know what you're doing or you're not being careful, it's you can yeah. over, you can overdo it with anything. But another thing that's interesting is I think a lot of people don't realize just how much history is involved with this plant. Some people grew up thinking it was like foreign that we didn't really know much about. It was illegal. But actually, we have thousands of years of of history behind this. We know shamans used to use it. Yeah. We know it was used medicinally. Yeah, Boston existed because of the hemp trade. Boston's big rope work were sort of the center of the American Revolution in Boston. That's where all the sort of tough guys were that, uh, that took on the Brits were working in these, these in rope-making factories. That was the big, the big use of it. They used to grow in really poor areas of America, like Kentucky. It's always been a fringe crop. And I think that's one of the reasons why it never got the sympathy of other crops was because it wasn't really grown in places like England. It was grown in places like Russia, 
right? And it wasn't grown in New England, it was grown in Kentucky. It's a it's an ugly crop to work with. But didn't George Washington have it and, and Thomas Jefferson on their plantations? They grew when they had to. Problem with it is that uh, it's easy to grow. Uh, the um, you have it's processing it that's a real bugger. Um, just like the cotton, cotton before the cotton gin, the processed hemp, you had to cut the stalks down and you had to let the stuff rot in a pond. And then you had to work the fibers out when it's wet. And nobody wanted to do that. So places where labor was so cheap and land was so marginal that people would do basically anything. Hemp growing was so unprofitable for the amount of labor that went into it that even slavery wasn't economically feasible for hemp growing. East Prussian peasants were growing it in large amounts. So the Brits were importing the stuff from Russia and, and Poland and places like that. In French Canada, they tried to get people to, to, to grow it um, during the French regime here, and they didn't want to grow it. But everybody wanted it for the navies. It was a, it was a strategic product. So once the navies of the world didn't beat the rope, and once you had other synthetic ropes, cotton ropes and stuff, hmm. And people can demonize it as this, as this dope plant. Mm. Now, it's come back as a fiber because it has a whole pile of really useful um, things about it. And, and a lot of stuff from the oils are useful, too. The processing of it is a lot easier now than it was. There were, there were machines that were just coming in at the time it was banned that would have made that processing a lot easier. And I'm pretty sure that since people started to be able to grow it under license in different parts of the world because we can grow it in Canada. I'm not quite sure what's happening in the States, but there's places in Europe that, where they've been growing it for years. So you have, a, I think, a, a critical mass there where it's worth the time for engineers and mechanics to sit down and work out ways of, of making the processing cheaper. Yeah, I know like in the Netherlands, they grow it for many countries in Europe where it's legal for medicinal purposes. So like Italy, for example, they get all their hemp from the Netherlands where they grow it. But there's also, um, people use the oil as just a light oil, with medicinal or not. On your salad. Yeah, and, and uh, it's it's fairly expensive because compared to some of the soybean plant that grows a, where you get a lot, the ratio of like rest of plant, to, so the seeds are sort of a side thing that come off it. Mm-hmm. The, the plant itself is... is to be huge, like 12, 15 feet tall. Like oh, wow. the old weed that people used to grow in the 1970s. Now, the marijuana itself has been so hybridized, but the, a marijuana plant and a hemp plant barely resemble each other. And yet it's treated in North America. The hemp is treated in North America like something that's just so, so wickedly dangerous to... <laughs> To grow and have around. Originally, it was like the same plant, but now you're saying there's basically bred different strands of it, and some of them have THC a lot, and then so the the hemp yeah. that's kind of used for Is fibers really doesn't have much of it, right? Is that but the difference? Just, yeah, I, I I mean the only the only sort of drug value that a hemp plant could possibly have is is somebody trying it and conning somebody into believing that they're buying marijuana. Um, but boy, that you'd have to be a total rube to, to fall for that. <laughs> I, I just don't get it. Um, now that I, I visited a hemp farm a few years ago, and I asked the farmer, does anybody ever steal this stuff? And he said, well, a couple of times I found garbage bags full of, of leaves and stuff in the field where somebody had started stealing it and had run away. But that was that was really about it. They tried some of it and decided it wasn't for them? I just feel terrible when I yeah. smoke this. <laughs> <laughs> They're sort of diverged now. Way back in the day, I guess if, if you sat down for a long time and smoked the very flower tops of the hemp plant a lot, you might have got some sort of buzz. But I mean, people supposedly smoke corn stalks. Huh. Uh, and, and, you know, corn, not corn stalks, the corn silks got high. Like, I've seen homeless guys split a bottle of Listerine in front of the Parliament building in Canada. What kind of like social impacts would you think might actually come with legalization of marijuana in particular or drugs in general? Are you in favor of kind of all legalization of drugs, like a Portugal kind of model, or yeah. you think... Yeah, I, I, I came around to that like 30 years ago when I saw in the UK that people were prescribed maintenance doses of heroin or methadone and were able to make a living. Like, this is this was something that the National Health Service in the UK decided to do. You'd go in, you'd look at a heroin addict, and they'd say, yeah, okay. And rather than having to steal for a living to get the money to buy the heroin or otherwise be a social burden, they gave you a prescription, you got the heroin, which is you know, 
the intrinsic value is almost nothing. Yeah. And an awful lot of people who are heroin addicts were able to work um, or at least get by without having to worry about where that money was going to come from. Because when you have an addiction that's that, that's that strong, you are going to satisfy no matter what it takes. So whether it's the theft or prostitution or, or you know, being part of the dealing system or whatever, you're going to end up doing that. So, so I, I think when you have these kind of addictive drugs and the opiates that we see around now, that needs to be treated as a medical addictive problem. And that means basically satisfying the addiction until there's space in the treatment system for people to be treated for the addiction if they want to be. And, and stop seeing this as, I mean, what, what is a crime? Like, let's work out what a crime is. You know, a, a crime is, is some sort of an offense where... To someone else. Pardon? It's, it's a, a crime is when you hurt someone else, right? Usually. It's, and it, it's based on a moral failure. It should be. Yeah. So you, ha- you have to form an intent, usually, uh, to commit the crime. And that's, that's your moral failing. And then you have to act on it. An addiction is not a moral failing. It's... it's a, a disease or a psychological uh, self-treatment that's called terribly wrong. And I think almost all addictions really are that. People trying to medicate for underlying problems that they have that come from, say, anxiety or depression or abuse or post-traumatic stress. To say that somebody who has those problems and is self-medicating to the point where they become addicted or they can't function because they don't want this underlying thing to come back, is a bad person, and we're going to add to that by charging them and criminalizing them, jailing them, tagging them with a record. You know, it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't make the person not an addict anymore. It makes the person an addict and a criminal. Yeah. So you've got two problems. So the you know the medical system treating these problems. The, the treatment comes from the drugs sold by organized crime. Yeah, exactly. And if we look. We look down to you know Central America and Mexico and South America and see what organized crime that you know creates these drugs is doing to itself and, and to a lot of innocent people. I think that a factor that into the whole cost of 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 you know criminalization of of, of these sort of self medications. And um, I think we've got to stop seeing people as as just simply bad. Uh, you know, if I was depressed and I took an antidepressant for that, and I was felt better and I could work, people would go, "Oh, that's good." But if I couldn't get that, if the only antidepressant that was around was sold by the mob, yeah, exactly, and I had to buy yeah. it from the mob, uh, I would probably do that, right? And that's why it's expensive because it's controlled and that fuels the crime because people have to steal to pay for it. Yeah, but it's a cheap, cheap, cheap substance to produce. I mean, they yeah. produce yeah. it in Afghanistan on the most marginal land because the poppies grow yeah. everywhere. And then it fuels the war. It fuels ISIS. Basically, we're also paying for ISIS by all the poppy, poppy mm. growing in Afghanistan. And, and then you get up to the sticks sort of along the Canadian border in places like Vermont and, and rural Ontario, rural Canada, we're having the same problem of people who are using prescription drugs like Oxy, where they're prescribed the drugs or, or the day that somebody else has been prescribed the drugs, and then they've been cut off by doctors who won't prescribe them anymore. And there's like a, basically no difference between Oxy and like heroin or meth. So, I mean, it's very easy to get addicted to something much, much more serious by relying yeah. on pharmaceuticals than it is by smoking something like cannabis or maybe not even smoking it, doing something healthier like vaporizing it or eating it with coconut oil. Yeah, I think I think it might really help in some of those places when we have uh, marijuana legalization. A lot, a lot of those folks are already growing a lot of weed, so they may find themselves up against the government. That might play out to be interesting. But we need to look at also the mental health services that are available in fringe areas of the country. And fringe areas of the country used to be the sort of, you know, inner cities, but now they are the parts of America that vote for Trump. Uh, you know, small towns where industries are gone, where farm work is run by corporations, where there's many opportunities for white collar work anymore. A lot of automation has happened. And folks who are stuck there are just getting loaded. And until we deal with some of those issues, we're going to see a greater expansion of, of drug addiction among people who are not traditional addicts. There's one other aspect I think we should focus in on here that's really interesting. Cannabis has become much, much 
stronger, much more THC dense in recent years, since especially since we've started yeah. utilizing it in the states. The stuff that the hippies were smoking uh, is it was like like less than four percent THC or something like that. And now some yeah. of these dispensaries are selling these super strains with like 27, 28 percent. And these kids, you know, some of them being like, you know. 18 years old are like smoking tons of this stuff and their brains are still developing and they don't realize that their brain is in such a pivotal state. Yeah. That's a huge developmental time for, for a, a young adult. To, and if you're smoking tons of <laughs> cannabis, I mean, that's especially if it's loaded with m- much more THC than it used to be. What do you think about that? Well, for one thing, like, okay, I have an 18 year old son and I have a 23 year old daughter. They would be used to that kind of strong weed. I, I haven't smoked pot in years. I have asthma, as people would tell the with a big sign like Darth Vader on the podcast. So I don't smoke anything. I know that if I like rolled up a joint the way I would have rolled up a joint when I was 18 and smoked the stuff that's out there, I would get completely blasted and blot up. I think my kids would know that the stuff, you know, like, I have to sit down and see if they, you know, how they would roll a joint if, if they would, you know, family activity. They had not enough stuff. <laughs> yeah. All right, kids, up, let's smoke some weed. Yeah, this is the way I smoked at my grandfather when I was 19. Wow. Because um, I wanted to see if it was the same as when he was on the boat because he, he would tell me these stories of working on the Great Lakes ships. Anyway, um, I, think, I think they get it, but I, I do worry about. Uh, teenagers who would start really young and smoke a lot of weed all the time. People who already have problems, just like I was talking about people self-medicating with other drugs or things like depression, anxiety, uh, insecurities, uh, and PTSD, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, you know, reaching for anything that would take the edge off probably seems like a good idea to a young person. And I do worry about people smoking to the point where schizophrenia becomes an issue, um, where brain damage becomes an issue. And I guess it's easy to say that you know parents should watch for what their kids smoke. But I, my kids are out like a lot. You know, most weekends they're out like every weekend. I have no idea. You know, I can only I can only sort of believe what they say uh, unless I would become one of those parents. I heard that cannabis can't induce schizophrenia unless you're already predisposed for it it can only speed up the yeah, development think, of it yeah and then in that case if you if you get diagnosed with schizophrenia the best thing you can do is smoke cannabis so it's basically like smoke them if you got them like it's not gonna really you're either gonna become schizophrenic which is like five percent of potheads or you're not gonna become schizophrenic yeah. and if you do become schizophrenic keep smoking pot because it's the only thing that's gonna help you uh, yeah it, it may well be and I'm going to sound like a real screw all now but we don't give our kids as much grief for smoking pot as we give them grief for changing the litter box, the cat's litter box. <laughs> or not changing it, I guess. Because the, well, no, there's, apparently there's a, a, there's a correlation between diseases that you can pick up from cat feces and schizophrenia. Oh. Uh, my wife that is, is a uh, nasty chemical in kitty litter. Oh, yeah. My yeah. wife has studied nutrition and health sciences before she, um, before she became a lawyer, and she knew about this. So we, we, you know, it's it's one of those weird things that we do here is that, you know, you can look it up on Google or something. I used to do a lot of writing on mental health issues and go to hospital for the, what we sort of call a hospital for the criminally insane and meet with a lot of people who were in there who were serial killers, other murderers, arsonists, and whatnot. And many of them were schizophrenic and many of them were on drugs as kids. But again, correlation and causation come into it, right? What I would love to see is, is is just get all the ideology, all of the sort of investment, moral and intellectual investment out of the picture and really do research on this stuff yeah. properly. People don't want to learn though. People don't want to do research. They don't want to go they don't want to go do this work. We're not exactly a society built on open mindedness and, and um and research uh, anymore. So I guess I should watch what I say. Uh, but it would be great to, to actually have some real facts on this stuff instead of, you know, you hear like stuff like, you know, marijuana will cure whatever, and they go like, yeah. and then you hear, well, if you smoke, if you smoke marijuana, you will go crazy and die. Well, you will die. Yes, you will die. Yeah, even breathing oxygen will do that to you. 
Actually, oxygen does cause cancer, probably. But I love this guy. No, it's true. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so much. Unfortunately, we have to breathe it or we die. But, uh, it's because it's an oxidizer. It's a, oxygen is a really powerful chemical. Actually, mm-hmm. it's the second most reactive chemical after fluorine, and it actually oxidizes our cells. No, it's it's true. Are you describing high on life? Is this what you're? No, describing? no, it's, it's 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 well. So oxygen was originally a poison to all organisms on Earth, and there was a mass extinction as a result of the oxygen in the atmosphere, which was toxic to most animals. Like two, three billion years ago, when Microbacteria started pumping it out. I was actually joking, but I should have known you would actually have a scientific answer for that. <laughs> you said he was a fax machine. So. Yeah, if you're going to hang out with a fax machine, you better expect some facts. I would like to see marijuana become like a less, you know, a less uh, obsessive thing in the world for police and stuff. And I would like cops to find who's the person who stole my bike. <laughs> nice. Might be in Hamilton. And I, you know, I, I've gone to court, and I think any anybody who's ever been a newspaper reporter or a police officer or worked in courts could say the same thing. I've gone to court um, for many, many years, and I've seen so many people who've been in court say, "I was drunk and I hit her." You know, I wouldn't have hit her if I wasn't drunk. It was the booze that did it, right? Yeah. I have never seen anybody say I smoked a joint. The one thing about marijuana that doesn't make you so, as ugly as as booze does. Well, booze yeah, absolutely. I think that's probably true. Absolutely, I think that's not. probably Definitely. true. But if it was illegal, they wouldn't go to court saying, "Oh, I, yeah, I, I, exactly." <laughs> well, this is I actually high. this is actually my final. This is actually my last uh, point of conversation. I wanted to uh, ask your perspective on Mark is is cannabis actually a drug? Because there's not really a lot of processing involved with with you know getting t- consuming THC. You're really just get, you're growing the plant, uh, you're drying it, and then you're either vaporizing it or smoking it or cooking it into coconut oil. And with alcohol, you're, you know, fermenting it and you're doing like there's this huge process for getting, you know, for making alcohol and, you know, for pharmaceuticals, there's a huge process. So it's kind of the question is like, is are things like cannabis and mushrooms and, you know, anything that's like naturally occurring? Is it actually a drug? That's really that's that's a good question. Uh, Is caffeine a drug? It's uh, is sugar a drug. You know, I I have trouble getting past the dairy queen this time of year. Is that a drug? Um, yeah, it's 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 a really tricky question. Uh, maybe we should even wonder about the idea of drugs being anything uh, other than things that really change the wiring of your brain in a serious way. You know, yeah. What a what a great question. That's what I've been struggling with because I personally enjoy cannabis. And, and, and the word drug is so morally loaded, right? Well, drug is a drug's a modern word. Like the people bat ten thousand years ago smoking pot didn't call it a drug. They you know, they did that, that word didn't yeah. exist until the pharmaceutical you know companies came along and started selling I mean spices are drugs, like uh, cayenne pepper you know, changes your brain chemistry when you you know, when you eat it. Uh, when people eat hot food, they do that to release endorphins into their brains, which is the same thing. Good point. Yeah, I mean, I guess everything's a mind-altering well, drug. Every, I mean, everything is you adaptation. Anything that's not food Jog- is a drug, basically. And and jogging is a drug, right? Like, people yeah. jog to, to change their brain chemistry mm-hmm. and get that runner's high. And if you don't think that's addictive, you know, go read about people who are long-distance runners who break their leg or something and they can't run. You can definitely exercise your body into the ground. Actually, there's this all this new research this year showing that too much exercise is just as bad as being sedentary. And you can also end up with morbid withdrawal and depression mm. if, you, if you suddenly stop doing that. So you are addicted. You are addicted to something that is changing your brain chemistry. Uh, and, it's, and you're not even digesting anything. You're just doing something with your body, right? So, moral of the story, so, don't yeah, run. Right. <laughs> don't exercise. <laughs> don't exercise. <laughs> don't do anything. Well, I think the moral of the story no, no, is, I think the moral of the story is it's actually, it's actually kind of, it's kind of a warning to people who are experimenting with cannabis because it still kind of is an experiment. Although I would say it's a safe experiment because there's like thousands and thousands of years of history behind it. Uh, it is still kind of like an economic experiment and it's kind of like a, you know, so a social experiment. Yeah. It, but at the same time, what you guys are saying that is true is that everything is kind of mind altering because what we do as biological organisms is adapt to our input so anything you put into your system your body's going to adapt to and cannabis is just another one of those things you can overdo it just like anything else I, that's it like if you do anything in such an immoderate way 
uh, like whether it's you're spending all day on Twitter or video games or something, or obsessing over food all the time, or in any kind of way where you've given yourself over to something artificial. You know, it's time to sort of take stock of yourself and say, you know, maybe I don't have the control over my life that I should have. One time I refrained from coffee for a whole week just to see what what it would do. And yeah, I had the headaches and stuff like that. I'm much meaner if I haven't had coffee than I am if I haven't had cannabis. <laughs> well, Mark, this has been such a fun conversation. Uh, thanks for the time. Uh, I want to encourage everybody I'll to check out. Anytime. Yeah, I, I want to encourage everybody to check out uh, your books, Hemp and uh, The Killing Game. We're going to turn it over to the listeners now. We want to know what you think about weed being legal. Do you think it should be recreational everywhere? Do you think it should still have restrictions here and there? Leave a comment on YouTube if you're watching. That's a great place to involve yourself in the conversation. Speaking of YouTube, you might have noticed it's been off YouTube the last few weeks. That's because we've been getting the new YouTube channel set up. It's up and running this week. Be sure to check it out, youtube.com slash spellboundshow. Like I said, that's a great place to check it out if you like to leave comments. Comments. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcast and CastBox. That way you never miss an episode. If you want to send me an email, you can do that. Hello at spellboundshow.com. Next week, we're talking to Ian Bremer, world-renowned political scientist, New York Times best-selling author, columnist and editor-at-large at Time, and referred to as the guru by The Economist and The Wall Street Journal. That's quite a setup. You don't want to miss that next Monday. Until then, I'm Julian Smith. This has been Spellbound. Thanks so much for listening. See you guys soon.